Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, Chapter 1, The Boy Who Lived. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of Number 4, Prevent Drive, were proud to say that they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. They were the last people you would expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious, because they just didn't hold with such nonsense. Mr. Dursley was the director of a firm called Granick, which made trades. He was a big, beefy man with hardly any neck, although he did have a very large moustache. Mrs. Dursley was thin and blonde and had nearly twice the usual amount of neck, which came in very useful as she spent so much of her time training over garden fences spying on the neighbors. The Dursleys had a small son called Dudley, and in their opinion there was no finer boy in the winter. The Dursleys had everything they wanted, but they also had a secret and their greatest fear was that somebody would discover it. They didn't think they could bear it if anyone found out about the Potters. Mrs. Potter was Mrs. Dursley's sister, but they had met for several years. In fact, Mrs. Dursley pretended she didn't have a sister, because her sister and her good-for-nothing husband were as un-Dursley as it was possible to be. The Dursley shredded to think that what neighbors would say if the Potos arrived in the street. The Dursleys knew that the Potos had a small son too, but they had never ever seen him. The boy was another good reason for keeping the Potos away. They didn't want Dudley mixing with a child like that. When Mr. and Mrs. Dudley woke up on the dull grey Tuesday, our story starts. There was nothing about the cloudy sky outside to suggest that strange and mysterious things would soon be happening all over the country. Mr. Dursley hummed as he picked out his most boring type of work, and Mrs. Dursley gossiped away happily as she wrestled and screaming darkly into his high chair. None of them noticed the large, downy old flutter past the window. At half past eight, Mr. Dursley picked up his briefcase packed Mrs. Dursley on the cheek and tried to kiss Dursley goodbye, but missed. Because Dursley was now having a tantrum and throwing his cereal at the wall. Little tyke, chortled Mr. Dursley as he left the house, he got into his car and backed out of number four's drive. It was on the corner of the street that he noticed the first sign of something peculiar, a cat reading a map. For a second, Mr. Dursley didn't realize what he had seen. Then he jerked his head around and looked again. There was a tabby cat standing on the corner of Private Drive, but there wasn't a map in sight. What could he have been thinking of? It must have been a trick of some light. Mr. Dursley blinked and stared at the cat, and it stared back. As Mr. Dursley drove around the corner and up the road, he watched the cat in his mirror. It was now reading the sign that said Privet Drive. No, looking at the sign. Cats couldn't read maps or signs. Mr. Dursley gave himself a little shake and pulled the cat out of his mind. As he drew towards town, he thought of nothing except a large order of drills he was hoping to get that day. But the edge of the town drills were driven out of his mind by something else. As he sat in the usual morning traffic jam, he couldn't help noticing that there seemed to be a lot of strangely dressed people around. People in cloaks. Mr. Dursley couldn't bear the people who dressed in funny clothes. The get-ups you saw on young people. He supposed this was some stupid new fashion. He drummed his fingers on the steering wheel and his eyes fell on a huddle of these weirdos standing quite close by. They were whispering excitedly together. Mr. Dudley was enraged to see that a couple of them weren't young at all. Why, that man had to be older than he was and wearing an emerald green cloak. The know of him, but then it struck Mr. Dudley that this was probably some silly stunt. These people were obviously collecting for something. Yes, that would be it. The traffic moved on and a few minutes later, Mr. Dudley arrived in the grinding parking lot, his mind back on trails. Mr. Dursley always sat with his back up to the window in the office on the ninth floor. If he didn't, he might have found it harder to concentrate on drills that morning. 
He didn't see the owl swooping past in broad daylight, though people down the street did. They pointed and gazed open mouthed at owls after owls sped overhead. Most of them had never seen an owl even at night time. Mr. Dursley, however, had a perfectly normal owl free morning. He yelled at five different people. He made several important telephone calls and shouted a bit more. He was in a very good mood until lunchtime, when he thought he had stretched his legs and walked across the street to buy himself a bun from the bakery. He had forgotten about all about the people in cloaks until he passed a group of them next to the bakers. He eyed them angrily as he passed. He didn't know why, but they made him uneasy. This bunch of were whispering excitedly too, and he couldn't see a single collecting tin. It was on his way back past them, clutching a large donut in a bag, that he caught a few words of what they were saying. The potters. That's right. That is what I heard. Yes, dear son Harry. Mr. Dursley stopped there. Fear flooded him. He looked back at the whispers as if he wanted to say something to them, but thought of better of it. He dashed back across the road, hurried up to his office, snapped at his secretary not to disturb him, seized his telephone, and had almost finished dialing his home number when he changed his mind. He put the receiver back down and stroked his mustache, thinking, no, he was being stupid. Potter wasn't such an unusual name. He was sure that were lots of people called Potter, who had a son called Harry. Come to think of it, he wasn't even sure his nephew was called Harry. He had never seen the boy. It might have been Harvey or Harold. There was no point in worrying Mrs. Dursley. She always got so upset at any mention of her sister. He didn't blame her if he had had a sister like that, but all, all the same, those people in cloaks. He found it a lot harder to concentrate on drills that afternoon, and when he left the building at 5 o'clock, he was still so worried that he walked straight into someone just outside the door. Sorry, he grunted. As the tiny old man stumbled and almost fell, it was a few seconds before Mr. Dursley realized that the man was wearing a wild cloak. He didn't seem at all upset at being almost knocked to the ground. On the contrary, he, his face split into a wide smile and he said in a squeaky voice that made passer by stare, Don't be sorry, my dear sir, for nothing could upset me today. Rejoice, for you know who has gone at loss. Even muggles like yourself should be celebrating this happy, happy day. And the old man hugged Mr. Dursley around the mill and walked off. Mr. Dursley stood rooted to the spot. He had been hugged by a complete stranger. He also thought he had been called a mug, whatever that was. He was rattled. He hurried to his car and set off for home, hoping he was imagining things, what he had never hoped before because he didn't approve of imagination. As he pulled into the driveway of number four, the first thing he saw, it didn't improve his mood, was the tabby cat he had spotted that morning. It was now sting on his garden wall. He was sure it was the same one. It had the same marking around its eyes. Shoo, said Mr. Dursley, laugh. The cat didn't move. It just gave him a stern look. Was that normal cat behavior? Mr. Dursley wanted. Trying to put himself together, he let himself into the house. He was still determined not to mention anything to his wife. About Mrs. The next door problem with her daughter and how Dudley had learned his name won't. Mr. Dudley tried to act normally. When Dudley had put to bed, he went into the living room in time to catch the last report on the evening names. And finally, boot watchers everywhere have reported that the nation's owls have been behaving very unusually today. Although owls normally hunt at night and are hardly ever seen in daylight, there was, have been hundreds of sightings of these birds flying in every direction since sunrise. Experts are unable to explain why the owls have suddenly changed their sleeping pattern. The news caster allowed himself a grin. Most mysterious and now over to Jim McGuffin with the weather. Going to be any more showers of owls tonight, Jim?
Well, Ted, said the madam, I didn't know about that, but it's not only the owls that have been acting early today. Viewers as far as Kent, Yorkshire, and Dundee have been phoning in tell me instead of the rain I promised yesterday, there have been a downpour of shooting star. Perhaps people have been celebrating bonfire night early. It's not until next week, folks, but I can promise a wet night tonight. Mr. Dursley sat frozen in the armchair, shooting stars all over Britain, always flying by daylight, mysterious people in cloaks all over the place, and a whisper, a whisper about the potters. Mrs. Dursley came into the living room carrying two cups of tea. It was no good. He would have to say something to her. He cleared his throat nervously. Oh, Petunia, dear, you haven't heard from your sister lately, have you? As he expected, Mrs. Dusley looked shocked and angry. After all, they normally pretended she didn't have a sister. No, she said sharply. Why? Funny stuff on the news, Mr. Dusley mumbled. All shooting stars, and there are a lot of funny-looking people in the town today. So snapped Mr. Mrs. Dusley. Well, I just thought maybe it was something to do with, you know, her crowd. Mrs. Dudley sipped her tea through pursed lips. Mr. Dudley wondered whether he dared to tell her he had heard the name Potter. He decided he didn't dare. Instead, he said as casually as he could, their son, he had be about Dudley's age now, wouldn't he? I suppose so, said Mrs. Dudley stiffly. What's his name again? Howard, is it? Harry, nasty common name, if you ask me. Oh, yes, said Mr. Dursley, his heart sinking horribly. Yes, I quite agree. He didn't say another word on the subject as they went upstairs to bed. While Mr. Dursley was in the bathroom, Mr. Dursley crept in the bedroom window as peered down into the front car. The cat was still there. It was staring down through the drive as though it were waiting for someone. He was imagining things. Could all this have been anything to do with the potters? If it did, if it got out that they were related to a pair of, well, he didn't think he could bear it. The Dursleys got into bed. Mrs. Dursley fell asleep quickly, but Mr. Dursley lay awake, turning it all over in his mind. His last comforting thought before he fell asleep was that even if the potters were involved, there was no reason for them to come near him and Mrs. Dursley. The Potters knew very well that he and Petunia thought about them and their kind. He couldn't see how he and Petunia could get mixed up in anything that might be going on. He yawned and turned over. It couldn't affect them. How very wrong he was. Mr. Dursley might have been drifting into an uneasy sleep, but the cat on the wall outside was showing no sign of sleepiness. It was sting as still as a statue, its eyes fixed unblinkingly on the far corner of the pivot drive. It didn't so much as quiver when a car door slammed on the next street, nor when the two owls swooped overhead. In fact, it was nearly midnight before the cat moved at all. A man appeared on the corner of the cat had been watching. So suddenly and silently you would have thought he had just swooped out of the ground. The cat still twitched and its eyes narrowed. Nothing like the man has ever been seen on private drive. He was tall, thin and very old, judging by the silver on his hair and beard, which were both long enough to tuck into his belt. He was wearing long robes, a purple cloak that swept the ground and high-heeled buckled boots. His blue eyes were light, bright and sparkling behind half moon spectacles and his nose was very long and crooked as though it had been broken at least twice. This man's name was Albus Dumbledore. Albus Dumbledore didn't seem to realize that he had just arrived in a street where everything from his name to his boots was unwelcome. He was busy rummaging in his cloak looking for something, but he did seem to realize he was being watched, because he looked up suddenly at the cat which was still staring at him from the other end of the street. For some reason, the sight of the scat seemed to amuse him. He chuckled and muttered, I should have known. He found what he was looking for inside his pocket. It seemed to be a cigarette silver slider.
he flicked it open, let it up in the air and clicked it. The nearest street lamp went out with a little pop. He clicked it again. The next lamp flickered into dark several times he clicked. They put out a until the only light left in the whole street were the two tiny pinpricks in the distance, which were the eyes of the cat watching him. If anyone looked out of their window now, every beady eyed Mr. Dusley, they wouldn't be able to see anything that was happening down on the pavement. Dumbledore slipped the pot out of back inside his cloak and set off down the street towards number four, where he sat down on the wall next to the cat. He didn't look at it, but after a moment, he spoke to it. Seeing you, Professor McGonagall, he turned to smile at Tabby, but he had gone. Instead, he was smiling at a rather severe-looking woman who was wearing square glasses, exactly the shape of the markings the cat had around its eyes. She too was wearing a cloak, an emerald one. Her back, black hair was drawn into a tight bun. She looked distinctly ruffled. How did you know it was me? She asked. My dear professor, I have never seen a cat sit so stiffly. You would be stiff if you had been sitting on a brick wall all day, said Professor McGonagall. All day, when you could have been celebrating, I must have passed a dozen feasts and parties on my way here. Professor McGonagall sniffed angrily. Oh yes, I have celebrating all right, she said impatiently. You'd think they'd be a bit more careful, but no, even the muggles have noticed something going on. It was on their nerves. She jerked her head back at the Dursley's locked living room window. I heard it. Flocks of all shooting stars. Well, they are not completely stupid. They were bound to notice something shooting stars down the Kent. I'll bet that was the Dartless Diggle. He never had much sense. You can't blame them, said Dumbledore gently. We have had a precious little to celebrate for eleven years. I know that, said Professor McGonagall irritably, but that's no reason to lose our heads. People are being downright careless, but on the street, in broad daylight, not even dressed in muggle clothes, swapping rumors. She threw a sharp side with glass at Dumbledore, he, though hoping he was going to tell her something, but he didn't, so she went on. A fine thing it would be if only you, very day you know who seemed to ha have disappeared at last. The muggles found out about us. Oh, I suppose he really had gone, Dumbledore. It certainly seems so, said Dumbledore. We have much to be thankful for. Would you care for a lemon drop? What? A lemon drop? These are kind of muggle sweets I am rather fond of. No, thank you, said Professor M McGonagall. Cold. I thought she didn't think of this was a moment for lemon drops. As I say, even if you know who had gone, my dear professor, surely a sensible person like you can call him by his name. All this you know who nonsense. For eleven years, I have been trying to persuade people to call him by his proper name, Voldemort. Professor McGonagall flinched, but Dumbledore, who was unsticking to lemon drops, seemed to have noticed. It all gets so confusing if we keep saying, you know who, I have never seen any reason to be frightened of saying Voldemort's name. I know you haven't said Professor McGonagall sound half exasperated, half admiring, but you are different. Everyone knows you are the only one you know who, oh all right, Voldemort was frightened. You flatter me, said Dumbledore calmly. Voldemort had powers I will never have, only because you are too, well. Noble to use them. It's lucky it's dark. I haven't blushed so much since Madame Pomfrey told me she liked my new earmuffs. Professor McGonagall shot a sharp look at Dumbledore and said, Those are nothing next to the remorse that are flying around. You know what they are saying about what, why he has disappeared, about what finally stopped him? It seemed that Professor McGonagall had reached the point she was most anxious to discuss. The real reason she had been waiting on a cold, hard wall all day, for neither as a cat nor as a woman, had she fixed Dumbledore with such a piercing stare as she did now. 
It was plain that whatever everyone was saying, she was not giving, going to believe it until Dumbledore told her it was true. Dumbledore, however, was choosing another lemon drop and did not answer. What they are saying, she passed on. It's the last night Voldemort turned up in Godric's hollow. He went to find the potters. The remorse is that the Lily and the James Potter are what they are, dead. Dumbledore bowed his head, Professor McGonagall gasped. Lily and James, I can't believe it. I didn't want to believe it, oh, Albus. Dumbledore reached out and patted her on the shoulder. I know, I know, he said heavily. Professor McGonagall's voice trembled as she went on. That is not at all. all. They are saying he tried to kill the Potter's son, Harry, but he couldn't. He couldn't kill that little boy. No one knows why or how, but they are saying that when he couldn't kill Harry Potter, Voldemort's power somehow broke and that's why he is gone. Dumbledore nodded glum. It is, it is true, faltered Professor McGonagall. After all he has done, all the people he has killed, he couldn't kill a little boy. It's just astounding of all the things to stop him. But how in the name of the heaven did Harry survive? We can only guess, said Dumbledore. We may never know. Professor McGonagall pulled out a lace handkerchief and dabbed at her eyes beneath her spectacles. Dumbledore gave a great stiff as he took a golden watch from his pocket and examined it. It was a very odd watch. It had twelve hands but no number. Instead, little planets were moving around the edge. It must have made sense to Dumbledore because he had put it back in his pocket and said, Hagrid is late. I suppose it was he who told you I would be here, by the way. Yes, said Professor McGonagall. And I don't suppose you are going to tell me why you are here of all places. I have come to bring Harry to his aunt and uncle. They are the only family he has left now. You don't mean, you can't mean that the people who live here, cried Professor McGonagall. Jumping on her feet and pointing at number four, Dumbledore, you can't. I have been watching them all day. You couldn't find two people who are less like us, and they have got this son. I saw him kicking his mother all the way up the street, screaming for sweets. Harry Potter come and live here. It's the best place for him, said Dumbledore firmly. His aunt and uncle will be able to explain everything to him when he is older. I have written them a letter. A letter, repeated Professor McGonagall faintly, sitting back down on the wall. Really, Dumbledore, you think you can explain all this in a letter? Those people will never understand him. He will be famous, a legend. I wouldn't be surprised if today was known as Harry Potter Day in the future. There will be books written about Harry. Every child in our world will know his name. Exactly, said Dumbledore, looking for seriously over the top of his half-moon glasses. It would be enough to turn on any boy's head. Famous before he can walk and talk. Famous for something he won't even remember. Can you see how much better off he'll be? Growing up away from all that until he is ready to take it. Professor McGonagall opened her mouth, changed her mind, swallowed and then said yes. Yes, you are right, of course. But how is the boy getting here, Dumbledore? She eyed his cloak suddenly as though she had thought the knight be hiding Harry underneath it. Hagrid is bringing him. You think it wise to trust Hagrid something as important as this? I would trust Hagrid with my life, said Dumbledore. I am not saying his heart isn't in the right place, said Professor McGonagall grudgingly. But you cannot pretend he is not careless. He doesn't tend to what was that. A low rumbling sound had broken the silence around them. It grew steadily louder as they looked up and down the street for some signs of a headlight. It swelled to a roar as they both looked up at the sky. A huge motorcycle fell out of the air and landed on the road in front of them. The motorcycle was huge. It was nothing for the man sitting astride it. He almost twice as tall as normal man and at least five times as wide. He looked simply too big to be allowed and so wild. Long tangles of bushy black hair and beard hid most of his face. He had hands the size of a trash can lid and his feet in the leather boots were like a baby dolphin's. 
In his vast muscular arms, he was holding a bundle of blankets. Hagrid, said Dumbledore, sound relief. At last, and where did you get that motorcycle? Borrowed it, Professor Dumbledore, sir, said the giant. Climbing carefully off the motorcycle as he spoke, young Sirius Black lent it to me. I have got his, sir. No problem were there. No, sir. House was almost destroyed, but I have got him out all right before the muggles start swarming it. He fell asleep as we were flying over the stalk. Dumbledore and Professor McGonagall went forward over the bundle of the blankets inside just visible. Was a boy fast asleep under a tuft of jet black hair over his forehead. They could see a curiously shaped cut like a bolt of lightning. Is that where? whispered Professor McGonagall. Yes, said Dumbledore. You'll have that scar forever. Couldn't you do something about it, Dumbledore? Even if I could, I wouldn't. Scars are common handy. I have one myself above my left knee. That's perfect map of the London Underground. Well, give him here, Hagrid. We'd better get this over with. Dumbledore took Harry in his arms and turned toward the Dursley's house. Could I? Could I say goodbye to him, sir? Asked Hagrid. He bent his great shaggy beard over Harry and gave him what must have been a very scratchy whisk gray kiss. Then suddenly Hagrid let out a howl like a wounded dog. Shh! His Professor McGonagall. You will wake the muggle. Sorry. Sobbed Hagrid, taking out a large spotted handkerchief and burying his face in it. But I can't say it. Lily and James dead, and poor little Harry off to live with muggles. Yes, yes, it is all very sad, but get a grip of yourself, Hagrid, or we shall be found. McGonagall whispered, patting Hagrid gingerly in the arm as Dumbledore stepped over the low garden wall and walked to the front door. He laid Harry gently at the doorstep, took a letter out of the cloak, tucked it inside Harry's blanket, and then came back to the other two. For a full minute, the three two uh, stood there and looked at the little bundle. Hagrid's shoulders shook, Professor McGonagall blinked furiously, and the twinkle light that usually shone from Dumbledore's eyes seemed to have gone out. Well, said Dumbledore finally, that's that. We have no business staying here. We may as well go join the celebrations. Yes, said Hagrid in a very muffled voice. I'll be taking Sirius's bike back. Good night, Professor McGonagall, Professor Dumbledore, sir. Wiping his streamy eyes on his jacket sleeve, Hagrid swung himself on the motorcycle and kicked the engine to life. With a roar, it rose into the air and off into the night. I shall see you soon, I expect, Professor McGonagall, said Dumbledore, nodding to her. Professor McGonagall blew her nose in reply. Dumbledore turned and walked back down the street. On the corner, he stopped and took out the silver pot outer. He clicked it once, and twelve balls of light stepped back in the street lamp so that Privet Drive glowed suddenly orange and he could make out a tabby cat slinking around the corner at the other end of the street. He could just see the bundle of blankets on the step of number four. Good luck, Harry, he murmured. He turned on the heel with his swish of the cloak. He was gone. A breeze ruffled the neat hedge of Privet Drive, which lay silent and tidy under the inky sky, the very last place you would expect astonishing things to happen. Harry rolled over inside the blanket without waking up. One small hand closed on the letter beside him, and he slept on. Not knowing he was special, not knowing he was famous, not knowing he would be woken in a few hours' time by Mrs. Dursley's screams as she opened the front door to put out the milk bottles, nor that he would spend the next few weeks being prodded and pinched by his cousin Dudley. He could know that at this very moment people meeting in secret all over the country were holding up their glasses and saying in hushed voices to Harry Potter, the boy who lived.